Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast in partnership with Kidney Care UK, sharing faith, knowledge, hope, and love. Hi, and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. My name is Dee Moore, and I am a kidney warrior. This podcast is dedicated to encourage, educate, and inspire as we explore all aspects of kidney disease, related chronic illnesses, and health. If you have any questions or ideas for topics you would like me to cover, please get in contact with me on social media using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. This episode features an interview that was recorded in December 2023 while I was still on peritoneal dialysis before I changed to hemodialysis and contains commentary of my experiences as a peritoneal dialysis patient before January 2024. My guest today from Birmingham, England is consultant nephrologist Dr. Lavanya Kamesh. Dr. Lavanya has been a specialist peritoneal dialysis consultant for 15 years and is passionate about home therapies. Dr. Lavanya joins me today to share an introduction to peritoneal dialysis. Hi, and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. How are you doing today, Dr. Lavanya? I'm doing well, Dee. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really looking forward to our interview today. Today, we are looking at an introduction to peritoneal dialysis. And for my regular listeners, people that watch my blog, you will know that I recently started peritoneal dialysis myself. And so, yeah, this is going to be covering something that is even more closer to my heart because something that I'm experiencing on a day-to-day basis. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to share about peritoneal dialysis. And you know me, I like to cover the highs, the lows, the ins, the outs. I like to really delve into a subject so that people are prepared I think that knowledge is power and I really like to empower people with knowledge to navigate their journey. And so for anybody who is at the point that they are considering which modality of dialysis they're going to go to, if you're thinking about peritoneal dialysis as opposed to hemodialysis, then maybe today will be helpful in making that decision. Everyone's got to make the decision that's right for them. But I think that if you know the advantages and the disadvantages and everything, then you can really make an informed decision. So before I say any more, let's continue. So we're talking peritoneal dialysis or PD for short. So we'll be using the shortened version PD each time we're talking. But yeah, PD is short for peritoneal dialysis. So I want to start with the basics, really. What is PD? Thanks, Steve, for the wonderful introduction. You explained a lot about the choice. And I think for when the kidneys fail, the waste products start to accumulate in the body. And the way to remove the waste products is by either hemodialysis, where you take the blood out of the body to take it through the machine to clear the waste products and return back. And that is the more familiar site because that's what you see on the newspapers and the news articles because that's the picture they show with somebody dialyzing using a blood machine. Peritoneal dialysis is a process where a tube is placed into the tummy and fluid is instilled into the tummy. The fluid draws the waste products and when you drain out the waste products are removed and the process gets repeated and that way you remove the waste products from the body so this is the main type so you know it's the the hemodialysis which is the blood dialysis and peritoneal dialysis which is the placement of the tube in the tummy to do the dialysis you mentioned that this tube and the name of the tube would be the catheter. It, it is a catheter. We call it the PD tube or PD catheter. So that's placed into the stomach, as you said, and then there's that process with 
discussed about the process in episode 100, actually, where mm. I spoke with Jerome Espy and we spoke about the cycle within peritoneal dialysis. And this is when you're using a machine. And we talked about the drain, fill, dwell cycle. So if we just break that down a little bit more. When we're talking about the drain part of the cycle, what happens then? The dialysis or the fluid in the tummy is already there. So you drain the fluid and then you fill the tummy with new fluid. So what the fluid does is that it draws the waste products from the body. It is just by simple diffusion. So the reason why it's called peritoneal dialysis is that there is a thin membrane, like a cling film, that is inside the tummy that coats all the organs. And it's like a plastic bag. If You know, it just expands. So if you can imagine, it is a kind of membrane-filled space where the tube sits in there amongst the meters of bowel and other organs. It sits outside all the bowels and stomach. It is in that cavity. So the fluid goes inside and it's surrounded by the membrane, the thin membrane. And that membrane is important because that's the one that is transferring the waste products from the body into the cavity. And it also draws up excess fluid from the body into that cavity. When you drain out, all of that fluid comes out. And you need to repeat that process again and again to keep removing the waste products and the excess fluid. So the two types of dialysis within the peritoneal dialysis is that what we call as manual bags. The manual bags are you have a bag of fluid, the patients will be taught to, to connect to the tube, and then the fluid goes into the tummy. So that is the fill process. So you fill the fluid into the tummy. There is no machine involved here. So you can put the bag on top of a shelf. Just by gravity, it just flows into the tummy. So it takes, say, five to ten minutes for the fluid to go in. So once the fluid goes in, then you clamp that bag with the top bag, and then you disconnect yourself, allow the fluid to rest into the tummy. So you go about doing your work, you know, go out with your family, go to your work, whatever you want to do. A few hours later, you again connect the bag and then the fluid is drained out. So that draws that waste products and excess fluid is drained out. And then the bag comes as a Y connector. So you've got one bag which has got the fluid and another is a drain bag. So they are connected together. So through the single connection, you drain out the fluid into a drain bag, and then you fill the tummy up from the fill bag. So you repeat that process again. So for a manual exchange, it will be about four times a day, we say. And you would typically do, say, when you wake up, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, you have around the lunchtime mark, around the tea time mark, and another bag in the night time which you drain out the next morning. So it's all simple gravity, no machine involved here. So the other one is the automated peritoneal dialysis, what we call as APD. And the APD involves a machine. You can set up the amount of fluid, say you can put two bags of five liters, for example, it's set up. And the machine is programmed to give, say, two liters of fluid each cycle. And in the night, you connect to the machine. You do the dialysis in the night. And in the morning, you disconnect yourself. You don't think about doing any more dialysis during the daytime. You go back in the nighttime and you connect yourself to the machine again. But 
both of this process requires careful training. Giving the ownership for the patients to recognize their symptoms, to teach and train how to do the dialysis themselves. It is not complicated. It doesn't require a science degree to do this. So it is a simple process, but it requires concentration and attention. And the one thing the PD unit talk about is hand washing, how to connect, how to disconnect, how to reduce the risk of infection. That is the key for all of us. So it is these two process, the manual exchanges and the APD. You've got the manual exchanges where you're doing it four times through the day. And then the APD, the automated one, the one that I do, which is done overnight. So rewinding back slightly. So you mentioned about the bags, the fluid. What is in this fluid? Yes, that's a very good and important question. So the bags have got electrolytes, that is, it's got the correct level of sodium. It has got a bit of potassium in it. It has got, uh, depending on the bag type, it will have something to correct the acid-base balance, the acidity of the blood. So it could be lactate-base, it could be bicarbonate-base. So a lot of salts in a simple language. It is a lot of salts there that are close to your body's composition, that are complementary, okay? So that we don't want to devoid the body of many of the salts by just instilling water. You can't do that. So it has got the correct amount of salt. And it has got a bit of sugar in it. The amount of sugar is small. And what it does is that that is the one that pulls excess fluid from your body. And there is another fluid called as extraneal, which we call as the pink or the purple bag because the tag is pink. So that bag has got a starch in it, not a sugar, but a complex starch in it, which again does the business of pulling the excess fluid. So you've got these bags and like you said, you've got the manual version and then you've got the automated version. Four times a day, to me, sounds like quite a commitment. It sounds like quite a lot of work. But obviously, some people choose that as their preferred modality. Who would the four times a day suit in your opinion, in your experience, who does that suit the most? When I started working in the PD department many years ago, at least, say, maybe we had 40-45% of the patients on manual exchanges. More than half the number of patients were on manual exchanges. But as time has gone by, we see that more patients prefer the nighttime machine than the daytime exchanges. Now, the daytime exchanges, it depends on the personality and what they want to do. For some people, they don't want to use the machine straight away, which is quite right. You know, so you want to use less strenuous one where you can wield it into your life pattern. You know, so I've had a young mom who wanted to do manual exchanges before dropping off the kids to school, lunchtime, just after pickup time. And she didn't want the machine overnight because she has had a young kid. She was getting disturbed in the night. She preferred the manual exchanges. There are advantages to that. We had another gentleman who was driving a truck, but he preferred to do the dialysis in the night whilst you were driving it. So he used to take appropriate breaks and do the cycles, the exchanges in the night and come home and put in the last bag to let it rest during the daytime when he sleeps. So that suited him. So it depends on each person's personal circumstances and more importantly, what they can cope with. Let's not forget Dialysis is an additional responsibility, additional and important responsibility, and it's challenging to weave it into your daily life. 
So clearly, automated or manual peritoneal dialysis suits different types of people in different circumstances. But what are the benefits of PD? Why choose PD rather than HD hemodialysis? First of all, from the patient point of view, it maintains their independence, their freedom and flexibility, managing their work and family commitments. So it is patient's choice. So whilst four times a day manual exchanges might sound a lot, but it would take probably an hour and an hour and a half per day. And that flexibility that people value, that independence that people value. With hemodialysis, the majority of the patients go to a center to have the hemodialysis four hours, three times a week. And so then you wait for the transport back and forth. And PD is a gentler form of dialysis. So that shifts in fluid is not drastic that we are sucking that excess fluid off within that four hours. And it is more gentle. That is more done daily, slowly and gentle. That tiredness that some patients, not all of them, face just after a hemodialysis session, you don't get that as much with PD. And So some patients on hemodialysis might say, oh, I feel so tired after the dialysis. I have one day to recover and then I'm back there to the unit again and I'm getting more tired. So there are those kind of benefits as well that it is a gentler form of dialysis. The other thing I would suggest is that an important part is that when you're first starting on dialysis, choosing peritoneal dialysis allows you to preserve your own urine output for a little longer. And that is precious urine because it gets rid of that excess fluid and it gets rid of whatever waste products it can. And that is important. So we know that in hemodialysis, the urine output can fall more rapidly than in peritoneal dialysis. So that is important. The other thing is, I would suggest, especially for somebody who is young, to look at their timeline with kidney problems. If they are young, starting on PD is good. You wait for a transplant. So you've preserved your veins for future use. You have your transplant. And if anything After many years, the transplant fails, then you still have your veins preserved that can be used for fistula for the future. Often it is hard when you're given the diagnosis of kidney problems and having to start dialysis to think about the timeline. And it is our responsibility as professionals to explain that to patients, to look at the wider context. And for some people, as they get older and frailer, they don't want to make that journey to the hemodialysis unit and waiting for transport back and forth. And they might feel that lifting the five-liter PD bag might be difficult. You know, often their partners are also elderly, so they may not be able to help. In the UK, we have something called as assisted APD program, which means that where possible, we can support with assistance. Healthcare professionals will come out, set up the machine, get rid of their fluid, and the patient can just be taught to connect and disconnect. So that favors the needs of a small group of patients. So you can see the advantages from the younger age through at whatever age. And then as they get older, we are also previously, we weren't able to support these patients. They all used to go to hemodialysis. 
we have learned that patients value their independence. They value their time spent at home rather than in transport and in a satellite unit. This assisted APD is able to reach patients who previously did not receive peritoneal dialysis. You mentioned before about peritoneal dialysis being more gentle. Is the reason why it's more gentle because you're doing it more frequently and over a longer period of time? Because in my mind, I'm thinking if I'm doing dialysis three times a week, then say I have my session on a Monday, then the toxins are building up the end of Monday or day Tuesday, and then I'll go back on Wednesday. And then in that four hour window, shoving a day and a half worth of toxins into four hours. Whereas if I'm doing peritoneal dialysis or if you do home hemo as well, it's done over a much longer period of time. And so the toxins aren't building up. So is that the reason why it's gentler? So the reason is that you're trying to do the process in four hours clearing the waste products and also pulling the fluid off in that process. We know the majority of patients on dialysis or on hemodialysis, it works very well. So both in terms of efficiency and how whether both the dialysis are equal, if I put it that way. But there are certain challenges with each of these dialysis. So I can't say one is completely bad and one is completely good. They both have their challenges. Oh, absolutely not. But I was just trying to work out what made it more gentle. It is just a machine. And what it is doing is you are allowing the fluid removal process much more gently than sucking it all up in four hours and clearing all of that in four hours. Right. It is. Right. Just a gentler process. Because like I said, this is an individual choice and I'm not trying to say one's good and one's terrible, but just trying to kind of tease out what makes it gentler on the body kind of thing. Any home dialysis takes a lot of commitment. So a patient might go through a phase of peritoneal dialysis, have a transplant, go through hemodialysis or do PD again and then get transplanted again. So you see that we have to encourage the patients to keep an open mind about all these modalities. And then it is the appropriateness of the dialysis at that particular stage for the patient that is important. And having those conversations to see where the patient is medically, what the needs are, emotionally, what the needs are, because we know that PD or a home HD takes a lot of motivation and family support. We've discussed about the benefits of peritoneal dialysis and the advantages in a sense of it's gentler on the body. You've got more independence and choice. You can decide what time you're going to connect up. Speaking personally, you can connect up and you still be on your laptop or watching TV or whatever. You don't have to stop completely when you're dialyzing. The main thing for me, though, is being able to do it from home. Not having to go in center to me is like sold. So we've talked about the advantages. Let's talk about the challenges, because like I said, we have to give, you know, the full picture, 360 view of this. So what are the challenges of PD? So the challenges are we always talk about infection first because it's a procedure that requires connection carefully. So, And we know with good patient education and training, the infection rates can be reduced very low. But if you ask patients and staff, that is the first thing we want to talk about. Or to be fair, we all dialysis and transplantation do increase the risk of infection. But with PD, we are saying, yes, that is a recognized complication, but we know the tools that we can use to reduce that risk. In terms of infection, with the manual bags, 
because you're doing four times per day, is there a greater risk of infection for manual bags as opposed to the machine? We can't really prove that as much, not in many of the studies. Theoretically, you're right. But again, it is individuals who are doing it. And it also shows their individual commitment. But we can't say that for sure. We have tried looking into it in our unit, but I don't think there is any particular trend. The second thing is that tube not functioning, so not draining out. It could be because or there are alarms on the machine, and that could be because the bowels haven't moved very much. We haven't talked about the bowels. With PD, we have to talk about the bowels. So that is the tube not functioning well. It's a recognized kind of feature. And there are various things we will do, increasing the laxatives. Sometimes the tube can flip up from its normal position, which will be down below, but then it flips up so it doesn't drain again with gravity. So that might require repositioning. So what would cause the tube to flip out of position? Because the tube is not attached to anything down below, the tube is not stitched down. So bowel movements or constipation or anything can flip that tube to some other place. And of course, I don't think many of my PD patients will do shoulder stands or head stands, but I would certainly advise them not to do it. You know, not any challenging yoga pose either. Right. So even gentle movement not can gentle affect movement. it. It is just the gravity. The tube is not stitched down. So if you're positioned against your gravity, then the tube might flip out. That is one of the theories. So if you ask me whether there are any studies for it, I will say no. <laughs> but it stands to reason. So. so no hanging upside down for long periods of time. <laughs> I would say no. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned about the bowel being an an important thing and can actually impact on the effectiveness of your PD session. So bowel health, obviously, keeping things moving is really important. In my experience, a renal dietitian came to see me to talk about fibre intake. So I think it's safe to say that as a PD patient, you're going to be looking at stuff that's going to keep things moving. Absolutely. Keep the bowel nice and free because you really don't want to, trust me, take it from me. You don't want to be hearing alarms in the night when you want to sleep. You want to have a nice, peaceful night. So keeping the bowels free and flowing, so to speak. Yeah. When I say flowing, I don't mean like a tsunami or anything like that. I mean, healthy movements to make your session successful. And so, You mentioned for some people, they take laxatives to help with that process. Yes, we do, especially when the catheter first goes in, we do encourage use of laxatives to get the catheter working well. So if you're constipated, then the drainage of fluid may not be optimal. So keeping the bowels moving is important. We generally advise patients to use laxatives. The idea is that you open your bowels every day without straining, not to spend all day in the toilet, but to make sure that you open the bowels every day without straining. And you can go up and down on the laxatives and we will walk you through what you should do when you see the medical practitioner or the nurses, they will take you through that. So do you have people that want to go the more natural route and rather than take laxatives? They take supplements or high fiber so, foods and fruits and things like that. Yeah, they do. A lot of people take fibers. They increase their fiber intake. And some people do need laxatives, but that is okay because you are doing something not natural to your body. You're putting in a tube and filling it up with fluid. So there is that risk of constipation. So if the bowels are working well, you don't need the laxative. But if you need help, don't hesitate to take the laxatives. Speaking from experience, when you first have the catheter fitted, when you first have the tube fitted, the operation within itself, does that kind of 
send your bowel to sleep? Yeah, I think you would have had anesthesia, depending on what anesthesia you've had or sedation you've had and the pain relief you've had. All of that will have an effect on your bowels, you know. So, yes, using the laxative. That's why soon after your catheter goes and using the laxatives is important. I think it's important that people know that it's normal after you've had the operation, that it does have that effect, because I think it can be, there's so much going on, and then you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not yeah. going to the toilet, something's wrong, and then the knock-on effect where you could get alarmed. So I really think it's important that people know, and you know, I'm always yeah. about natural methods as well, in terms of fibre, fibre, fibre. But again, some people can't take fibre, so yeah. it's an individual thing, what works for you as an individual. You mentioned before about drain pain, which happens during the drain part of the dialysis process. Do you experience drain pain with manual bags or is it just drain pain when you're using the machine? Drain pains are not common with manual bags. It's more common with the machine. You can have a little pain when you're having the first flush of your catheter the first time the fluid goes in and comes out you can have that is understandable because it's soon after your operation say a few days after your operation so you'll have a little twinge but manual bag because it's just simple gravity it doesn't cause as much drain pains but the machine dialysis can cause drain pains when we do the dialysis prescription we have certain things that we can do to tell the machine not to expect all of the fluid to be returned. That means you're not pulling all of the fluid off during each cycle, but more towards the end of the dialysis that you ask for the fluid to be taken out. So that way you're not disturbed in the night. And again, as you do more and more of the dialysis, that settles in. Some people might prefer doing manual bags first to get themselves into a routine and then do machine dialysis because that might also help with the drain pains in a way. So there are various things we can do to reduce the drain pain, but I appreciate that if you anticipate that there will be pain to make yourself to connect to the machine night after night, becomes very unpleasant. And if patients experience that, I would encourage them to talk with their PD team and look at the details of what can be done. It's small things in the dialysis prescription that would make a big difference. So I want to look at how we can help alleviate drain pain, but rewinding slightly, what causes drain pain? What exactly is drain pain? If your tummy is not used to fluid at all and you've got a tube there and with the dialysis process, we are using the machine to take out all the fluid. Towards the end of that process, there is very little fluid. I think the drain pain is more because there is no sump of fluid to float the catheter. It is touching various nerve endings, which is irritating. That's the only way I can think of. But if you have a sump of fluid that lifts the catheter up, and hopefully that sump of fluid there will help to alleviate the pain. Right. Because speaking personally, I Drain pain is no joke. It, it, it can be quite painful oh, yeah. to say the least, but the settings were adjusted and they call it a tidal where some fluid was left in and it made the world of difference. It went from excruciatingly painful to not excruciatingly painful. It was like a miracle. And yeah. I've spoken with a couple of patients and you don't have to suffer in silence. Do speak with your renal team. And for me, the settings were changed remotely. So it's not like I had to go into the hospital 
or the team had to come to my home to change the settings on the machine. In my case, they were able to change the settings when I was at home. And like I said, it was a night and day experience in terms of my distress and pain was alleviated instantly with that change and adjustment. So I think it's really important that people know don't suffer in silence. If this is happening, it's not supposed to be. Dialysis isn't supposed to be a torturing (laughs) process. It's supposed to be one that is helping you and helping your body get rid of the toxins and all the waste products that your kidneys aren't able to do without the extra help. Yeah, you're right. That communication between the PD team and the patient is so important. We recognize that that period of transferring from not having dialysis to having dialysis is extremely anxiety provoking. And we are now training patients and asking them to take full ownership of their own health. And that can be quite daunting. I always see the difference when I see the patients when they are training a month in, two months in, three months in, they are professionals. They will tell you exactly what's happening. So the kind of knowledge patients develop with their fluid, their blood pressure, their salt intake, the various things. So because you're taking ownership of your dialysis, you're forced to learn about all these things and to to make sure you stay healthy. So I think that communication is critical to and crucial to maintaining good health. So another challenge that you mentioned and (laughs) one that I have personally experienced is the alarms. So the machine alarming in the night, more than once through the night, being a challenge. So what kind of things causes the machine to alarm? So the common things are if you lie on the extension tube, then that alarm comes on because the fluid is not going out and there is an alarm for it. And patients usually learn to self-correct as well. And you also learn which side your catheter is. And sometimes if you're trying to drain on the opposite side, it will alarm because the fluid is going to go up. So if you're on your side, so patients learn to adjust their body very quickly, in fact, so to adapt to the dialysis. The alarms can happen, as we said, if you're constipated, that can cause alarms. Often you will see the PD team advising the patients to up the laxatives the first instance when there are lots of alarms, and often that can reduce the alarms. And the other side, it might require some change in your dialysis prescription, especially if there is a low drain alarm, and maybe the fill volumes are not adequate. So there might be other changes to the dialysis regime that is dependent on the individual, and the medical team will be looking into the details to see what can help. And often the same trick doesn't work for everybody. So you have to individualize and we try one after the other. We often are reluctant to put in everything at the same time. Then you never know what works. So there is a process for it. So it doesn't get sorted immediately. But if one doesn't work, then you go to the next step and you look at various things. It is a partnership between the patient and the PD team to keep that self-care of dialysis at home. It requires that partnership to work through. Absolutely. I think having a good relationship and good communication with your renal team is key for the success of your dialysis. And you mentioned about the different prescription of dialysis. So just explaining to the listeners there's different types of bag, so that goes onto the machine and that has the different levels of glucose inside the bag. So you've got yellow bags, which have the least amount, the green bags, it's the next step up. And then I think it's orange bags, it's the next yeah. step up. So you could start with two yellow bags. Maybe you might need to go to a yellow and a green or a green and a green or an orange and a green or different combinations. I'm just kind of throwing 
yeah. scenarios I out there. I think it is, a, it is more, as I say, it is more dependent on the individual. So we can't say that for all patients, this is what you should try, but the prescription is adjusted depending on the individual and the response. Yes. So, yeah. But there are various tools. What the listeners should take away from this is that there are various things we can do when you have got the brain pain, when you've got the alarms, and we can look at all of those in context. Yes. Obviously, this isn't medical advice. This is just putting the information out there. You have to consult your renal team for what's right for you as an individual. But just to let you know that you're not stuck if it doesn't work in one way your team will work through the process to find what works for you as an individual but it may take some time to kind of figure that out but hopefully you can get there don't give up persevere with it because it absolutely is worth it the freedom that you get of choice definitely is worth working through the challenges but I really just want people to be prepared. I don't think there's anything worse than going into a situation blind, a challenge comes and then it's like you've been hit with a ton of bricks. I think if you're given the possible challenges, then at least you can prepare yourself mentally for what is already a difficult situation. Yeah, absolutely right, Lee. We discussed before about the flexibility of PD and that it suits people with different lifestyles and people in different situations but who is PD not suitable for? So it's suitable for most patients except a small proportion of patients who have had extensive surgeries in their abdomen especially bowel surgeries that means that the peritoneum that we talked about could be damaged or scarred and the peritoneal dialysis may not work in that situation. So for patients who have had lots of bowel surgeries and things, I think the first thing to do is to discuss with the medical team and check on their suitability. So the common question we are asked is that, oh, the patient has had a cesarean section, a hysterectomy. That's all fine. So the peritoneum will be preserved that it's not a contraindication for PD. If you have got stomas, that might be more tricky because of the risk of infection. And also it depends on whether the peritoneum is preserved or not. So most units will try to avoid placing PD catheter in somebody who's got a stoma. Another thing that definitely has to be considered is space. Because when you're on peritoneal dialysis, and again, something I've experienced, fresh experience of, a lot of boxes arrive at your home because you are dialyzing anywhere up to seven days a week. There's boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes that come to your home. So that has to be considered in terms of the space that you have. And I know that you have the option of two weekly or four weekly deliveries, but generally it is a four week delivery. So you're talking what 40 odd boxes coming to your home each month. So I definitely think it's worth letting people know that it does take a lot of space in your home. So what we tend to do is that when patients come to the PD unit before for education purposes or when they are considering PD, we could show a rough estimate of what the boxes look like. Looking at it virtually when you do assessments virtually might still be a shock when you receive all those boxes the first time. You're right, depending on the space they have, we can do two weekly deliveries, we can do monthly deliveries. Some patients use their garage, they put a pallet down on the floor, raise base and put the boxes there if you don't want any wet boxes. And, you know, others use a storage box outside. So there are various ways of storing the boxes and doing it. Unfortunately, that is the nature of the dialysis because you can't do dialysis with small volume because it doesn't pull out all the waste products. You need bigger volume to be able to pull out the waste products. 
And we encourage patients to think about this. This is why pre-PD, that information, that education is crucial because that allows people to think and say, okay, where am I going to store these boxes? Okay, I could do here, I could do here. So it allows people to think about it. And again, some people might say, okay, how am I going to, if I store in the garage or downstairs, how am I going to bring it upstairs? So those are all the things the delivery drivers will take the fluid. D, you might know this, will take the fluid to where you want it to be placed. But you need to still move around. The other issue with these boxes is that you're always supplied with a little bit more boxes so that it lasts longer and you can have a bit of excess bags to compensate. And you need to do the stock take. So you need to see whether you're using up all the previous boxes and rotating the boxes so that you're using the boxes from last month before using the boxes from this month. So all of these are important and it requires a certain level of organization. One thing <laughs> we forgot to talk about flexibility, but we forgot to talk about the holidays. Yeah. I think one of the main things about PD is that, you know, it gives you the, within reason, you can plan to go on a holiday. For most European destinations, or you have to check with the destination, you know, with your fluid coordinator or with the unit. So you can go on a holiday there and the company will take the fluid to your holiday destination. It requires a fair bit of organization because you need to say to the unit when you want to go on holiday, how long you're going to go on holiday. And all these things need to be negotiated. Within the UK, if you want to go away for a weekend, you need to be organized. So you can draw the checklist of what things you need to take and then you put it in your car and away you go. So the first time will be daunting, but I always suggest do a weekend holiday in the UK. That might give you the confidence before you want to go away somewhere because that requires further organization. And similarly, your holiday destination should know they're expecting boxes and not one box. So that is important as well. PD units are well versed in advising patients about holidays. And I would encourage anybody who wants to consider holidays to discuss with their team. We also have information about traveling and holidays and dialysis. So check out episode 63. If you haven't listened to it yet, check out episode 63 of the podcast where we discuss about traveling abroad. There's lots of options for traveling abroad when you're on dialysis. So yeah, do check out that episode. I wanted to talk briefly about remuneration because I'm aware that not all dialysis patients realise that they are entitled to it. People might associate remuneration with hemodialysis patients, but not realise that as a peritoneal dialysis patient, you can actually get remuneration towards the cost of electricity and doing dialysis at home from the hospital. So um, is it just a case of speaking with your renal team and organising that or is there a different process for each it, hospital? It, it is, I think, most of the, this has been high on the agenda for all the renal units, especially in the last year with the cost of living crisis. And uh, there is information given to the patients even when they are starting on peritoneal dialysis. And there are lots of information in the kidney care website and others. And uh, yes, it is important that the patients know and do claim what they are entitled to. Absolutely. In summary, we've talked about what peritoneal dialysis is, the benefits, the the high, the lows, the ins, the outs. We've looked at remuneration. We've looked at challenges like drain pain and overcoming the challenges. We've talked about who PD is suitable for and 
who PD may not be so suitable for. And we've also talked about being able to travel. Even with PD, you can bring your machine along with you, but you also do have the option of going abroad. Obviously, it takes organization, but it is possible. It doesn't stop you from going to your holiday destination. And like I said, check out episode 63 for more information about that. And also a key factor. I mean, there there are many, but one that I really wanted to highlight is we talked about the preservation of your veins. Now, your veins, as we said in the Save Your Vein episode, are literally your lifeline. And so being able to preserve the veins longer, giving you more choice for the future, future proofing your veins is so important. So it is a really, really, really important advantage of doing peritoneal dialysis. But I wanted to give the final word to you, Dr. Lavania. So what final word of encouragement or advice do you have for the listeners? The PD unit is there to support you. Self-care can be daunting, but you're always supported by the units. And as a PD community, we are very passionate about it. So I would encourage the patients to consider they want to preserve their freedom, their independence and their flexibility. Yes, consider PD. Thank you so much for joining me, for sharing this information. I know that it will help so many people out there. And for anybody who is considering which modality of dialysis that they're going to choose, I hope that this will give you lots of information that will help make that decision easier and that you can see the advantages for yourself to make that informed choice. Thank you so much for sharing this information today. You're welcome. Best wishes. Thank you for listening to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. And don't forget that you can contact me on social media using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. Please do subscribe to the podcast and please do tell a friend. New episodes of this podcast are released every other Monday. Until next time, take care and choose to live. Diary of a Kidney Warrior. Sharing faith, knowledge, hope and love.